Welcome back for this afternoon session. We're going to have three talks on Seth Theory and its philosophy, so you fasten your seatbelts. The first one is uh, by Claude de Lourdes and Cy Frickman, uh, and the title is Believing the New Actions. Oh, okay, should I use the microphone? Oh, you need better yeah. use it, yeah. Okay, that's right. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much to Francesca and all the organizers for giving me the, giving us the opportunity to present this paper here, uh, which has been co-authored by me and Sai Pidman. Uh, Sai, unfortunately, wasn't able to attend. Um, and it should be somewhere, you know, where it's at at the moment. Um, okay. Uh, let me start with the brief. Or, so let me let me uh, start with a brief commercial about the hyper universe problem. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the hyper. So uh, as you may have heard about in the uh, in the last few months. So the problem that has been launched uh, last year uh, has been uh, run uh, since uh, January last year. And um, so the goals of the program, um, I'll tell you some more details about how the program emerged, but let me just give you an overview of some of the uh, general goals. Um, so the idea was that, uh, so the program attempts to spell out a plausible theory of the Saturday to Malturus. Uh, so we're not making any particular assumption, a logical assumption about the nature of the multiverse. Uh, we're just uh, assuming that the multiverse is a matter of fact and set to practice. And uh, as it emerged immediately, uh, so uh, Sai's idea was that of uh, investigating whether there was any chance to find, to expand, in a sense, the realm of set to truth uh, uh, moving from a multiverse frame. Um, and actually, what we realized at a certain point was that, of course, there was no chance to expand the realm of saturated truth if there was no uh, prior uh, discussion of what a new axiom would be within the uh, multiverse framework. And so uh, that's why uh, we thought it necessary to address the issue of uh, the nature of new axioms and of the ways uh, we are supposed to identify the axioms within a modulus frame. But there's also a mathematical part within the, the problem, and it's a relevant part, of course, uh, because actually the problem emerged from some technical, mathematical, very technical mathematical stuff. And only afterwards there was uh, essentially a side head idea to uh, draw some uh, sort of um, uh, and draw some conclusions from uh, 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 this mathematical work and to add some uh, sort of uh, foundational uh, part to the program which had been developed at that point only right? Okay, so uh, let me uh, provide an outline of the, uh, of the talk. So, first of all, I'm going to give you some introductory notions which are relevant to the, uh, to the material I'm showing. Um, and this is done in the first part. And, uh, in the second and in the third part, I'm going to address the crucial point, which is necessary to understand in order to uh, detect a new way, sort of to isolate a new way to identify saturating. And the first of the two parts is addresses uh, attempts at characterization of the relationship between the universe and the multiverse. Because even if we are sort of uh, committed to the view that the multiverse is more or less a matter of fact and set theory to practice, the set theory is dealing with many models. And that in a sense those models can be seen as universes instantiating uh, different pictures of the real universe. At the same time, the real universe, or the real being, as is sometimes referred to, uh, still plays a role, does play a role within the practice itself. 
So there's a sort of uh, dynamic relationship between the two uh, sort of realities. And we'll see that the way this dynamic relationship is articulated is relevant to the way we're going to sort of provide a sort of a tentative solution to the, to the problem what axioms should be, uh, new axioms should be, uh, uh, what it means to find new set ready axioms. Uh, so, the second and third part are connected by the idea that it is necessary to articulate the relationship between the universe and the multiverse. And, of course, different articulations of this relationship have bearings on the notion of saturated truth within the multiverse. In the last section, I'm going to show you, essentially, the, the bulk of the new theoretical, sort of, in a sense, foundational proposal that I'm showing you today, um, the fact that we can't identify new axioms if we don't first completely restructure our vision about the concept, of, uh, our notion of new axiom, and uh, that the process, the procedure to identify new axioms consists of two levels. The first level is, uh, uh, in the first level, in the upper level, uh, we first have to formulate multiverse principles, general principles which refer to the function, to the internal function beyond the multiverse. And those principles that is what we call, uh, are what we call H principles. And then, through the acceptance of these H principles and through uh, determination of a satisfaction relation within the multiverse of the universes satisfying these H principles, then we will be able to see how new axioms can be obtained. And this will be done in the, in the last part of the talk. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I'll presuppose uh, sort of a uh, general knowledge of the sort of pair of uh, this dualism and sort of epistemological, uh, we could say, dualism within the philosopher's set theory between intrinsic evidence and extrinsic evidence for the acceptance of, the axiom, of an axiom. And uh, uh, intrinsic evidence. This dualism was introduced more or less dates at least as far as Gödel's 1947 article on conscious continuum problem. So the intrinsic evidence is supposed to be the kind of evidence which relates to the concept of set and of course the set theory more or less the concept of set or at least the concept of set we accept within the program is the iterative concept of set. Whereas, whereas the extrinsic evidence relates to Essentially, the fruitfulness of success, of richness, of consequences of certain axioms within the formal system. All right. So the work is essentially concerned with the tracing evidence. So our attempt is to define procedures, which, in a sense, which will be uh, precisely specified, allow us to say that new axioms are intrinsically motivated. Okay. So this is a sort of daunting task, in a sense. Uh, and of course, this is a work in progress. Uh, but we'll see that, of course, we'll have to restructure the and narrow a little bit the definition of intrinsic evidence in order to obtain the results I'm going to show. Okay, so the central question uh, uh, with which we have to start is whether we have grounds to believe that. So we are assuming that the axioms of ZFC are more or less intrinsically motivated. Uh, so we're now questioning that. Within the program, we assume that uh, the iterative concept of set is reflected by the axioms of ZFC. Of course, there's an ongoing debate. I'm not trying to avoid the difficulties with this view, but I'm just assuming that um, uh, for the sake of the uh, internal coherence of our proposal, we're not questioning the fact that the axioms of ZFC are intrinsically motivated. And uh, so, or at least, uh, most of them. Uh, and so the idea, well, here I say it's some of them, actually. <laughs> but, um, well, um, so the idea is, do we have the same, uh, are we able to find uh, the same degree of intrinsic evidence in favor of new axioms which, can which are going to extend ZFC? So that's the central question that we essentially wanted to address in the, uh, this paper. 
All right, so uh, just to have a taste of the difficulties, I just listed some example, well-known examples. So, why, if we believe the ZFC is a sort of eternal, sort of uh, gives us some guidance on how to sort of define set theoretic truth, uh, well, it is, uh, of course, it do doesn't provide per se uh, sort of eternal evidence in order to accept new axioms. Of course, it, ZFC is not supposed to give, uh, uh, if we had to add axioms to ZFC, ZFC itself is not supposed to give, uh, we, can, we can't take out from ZFC truths which, which can be added as new axioms. But at the same time, each time we want to add, for instance, the axioms I list in the slide, like uh, the existence, the axioms which says, the, the state's existence of a strongly inaccessible cardinal or constructability or determinacy. Of course, we have to provide new arguments for the internal evidence of the intrinsic motivation for these axioms. If we want to prove that there's a, a strongly inaccessible cardinal, of course, we have to uh, provide an argument that says that the, uh, the iterative concept of set can be expanded to uh, 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 in a way which conforms to the, um, uh, which leads to the acceptance of a strong and accessible. If you want to uh, argue in favor of constructability, we have to provide an argument that there's intrinsic evidence where we, that we should restrict the power set. All right, the same applies to determinacy that, that is even inconsistent with NFC. So we have to provide, in a sense, some intrinsic evidence in favor of the fact that the, what is captured by the axiom of determinacy intrinsically is uh, sort of a Swiss best uh, our set theoretic purposes than the axiom of choice. So, of course, there are some troubles with intrinsicness which are uh, sort of, um, I'm trying to list here um, in forms of um, questions. Um, so, we, we don't have a, a secure guide as to what kind of uh, internal evidence we, we are able to, to find in connection of the new axioms. Or at least, our proposal is dependent upon the idea that the presupposition that no new first order set theoretic principle uh, has a sufficiently high degree of intrinsic evidence to be accepted as an axiom. This is one of the sort of ideas, motivating the ideas related to our problem. If you want to work within a multiverse framework, we can't assume that there are, that it is possible to immediately articulate arguments in favor from intrinsic evidence, for, for the intrinsic evidence of mean axioms. And I'm gonna explain why it is so, because the procedure to identify axioms using intrinsic evidence uh, is gonna be uh, developed in a completely different Okay, so in a sense, we have to proceed beyond first order. That's what we are saying here. Uh, but not in the sense where we are buying the whole, we're moving up higher in the, we, we're gonna suggest we should uh, sort of buy a second order account of set theory. But in the sense that there should be something, uh, anything which has to be, uh, which, which, which is gonna work as, uh, a principle which allows us to identify new axioms, in a sense, has to proceed beyond the first order. So we're going to explain what way this is uh, sort of uh, reflected by our multiverse principles. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, uh, first we have to make sense of this. So we have to characterize in some way the relationship between the universe of sets, which is sometimes uh, depicted simply as the uh, the cumulative hierarchy, which is very well sort of known um, object, uh, <coughs> consisting of um, all sets formed from the empty set at the bottom and the iteration of the power set at successive stages and uh, the union of all the previous levels at uh, limit stages. Okay, so the multiverse is more or less something which I very roughly drawn in this picture, so a sort of collection of models, and so we can be sort of ontologically absolutely non-committal uh, about multiverse membership, so in a sense, in any definition 
Oh. Any any concept of the multiverse that, that could be uh, any sort of model. And as we saw yesterday, for instance, on Hankin's account of the multiverse, we should not restrict multiverse membership only to one type of model theoretic construct. Right? So we could have all the jangle of model theoretic uh, the all the, the whole model theoretic jangle within the multiverse. Right? But of course we're gonna, you know, if we want to get some results from the uh, concerning the identification of new axioms, uh, because as we as we as we uh, shall see, we we let to uh, make uh, give a more precise definition of, of multiverse match. Okay, so one way to characterize the relationship between the universe and the multiverse, or in a sense, the relationship between the truth in real in in the real B and the truth in the multiverse, is that given by truth in B as truth across the multiverse, <coughs> right? So this is our preliminary definitions uh, which are relevant to what I'm going to say. So you take essentially the multiverse, the collection of all, uh, very simply the collection of all models of uh, ZC, and then define uh, truth across the multiverse as a truth in each of the uh, of the members of the multiverse. And uh, so the equivalent mathematical characterization of the truth across the multiverse is simply, can simply be given, uh, or simply be given in terms of absoluteness. And recall the, the sentence is absolute between models if it, if it is true, uh, if it, uh, when, it, when, when it is true in one model, then it is uh, true in the other model and vice versa. So, one attempt to characterize the relationship between truth and B and truth in the multiverse is that identified as truth and B as truth across the multiverse. So, but the problem with this conception, I'm going to give you some more details in a moment. The problem with some conception is that it seems to eliminate, in a sense, the multiverse. So, at a certain point, you, you have to get rid of the multiverse. Because the real multiverse the gen in a sense, the genuine nature of the multiverse entails that there are some sort of internal differentiations which have to be kept until the end, in a sense. Uh, so actually, this perspective is that which has been pursued uh, by um, the proponents of the absoluteness problem. And uh, essentially, it, such, uh, it substantiates itself with the idea that if I can't freeze, in a sense, truth across the multiverse, so you can, I can't fix, sort of, in some way, invariance across the multiverse, then I can relate the truth across the multiverse to the, in a sense, to my, uh, to, uh, to my concept of the real universe, to the real me, right? Um, and uh, so the absoluteness program has been. What I call the absoluteness uh, problem has been pursued uh, successfully, at least to a certain extent. And actually, we can give a, sort of a trivial, we can sort of talk about trivial, uh, provide examples of trivial forms of absoluteness, uh, or le more or less trivial forms of absoluteness. <coughs> but the idea of the absoluteness problem is that uh, if we take a um, uh, consists in, uh, um, in trying to extend, of course, the extent of the absoluteness across the multiples. Uh, usually, um, much mathematical literature uh, um, addressing the absoluteness program, or based on the absoluteness program, the standard structure which is uh, referred to is the H kappa, which is uh, the structure of all sets such that they're Transitive closure is less than less than kappa. So we can start with h omega and get uh, uh, models m n with the same ordinals uh, uh, and get a theory which is the same in m and n. Then we have a, a more robust result which is due to famous levi schenkel theorem, and we get that. A more complex theory, the sigma 1 theory of a more complex structure, h omega 1, is the same in two models which have the same ordinals. 
And then we try to extend the absoluteness to more complex structures. So this is being pursued. Unfortunately, I can't give you more sort of very technical mathematical details of that. But in essence, uh, um, uh, so the idea is that <clears throat> you can extend absoluteness across the multiverse, but unfortunately, he had, or fortunately, he had to take further steps in order to induce the wanted degree of absoluteness. <laughs> you have to add some, some other axioms which do the job of course of freezing your notion of truth across the multiverse and also what we think is not um, acceptable in terms of the definition of the, uh, the very definition of the multiverse you have to restrict the multiverse to only to some uh, model theoretic constructs which are usually in some of the words I've mentioned here the set generic, set generic extensions, right? So the problem is that the axioms, of course, uh, Giorgio, Giorgio is going to kick me now, but some of the axioms there, uh, forcing axioms, don't seem to be intrinsically motivated. And also the restriction of the multiverse to the set generic multiverse, in our opinion, is not motivated either. Uh, so, well, this is a mathematical result which has been obtained recently by Friedman concerning absoluteness. Uh, I think I might uh, uh, possibly skip um, the, the examination of this one because it's not really terribly relevant to what I'm saying. But the idea is that you, if you have a, it, uh, um, if you want a theory which is compatible uh, with classes with a class of measurable cardinals, probably you can't have you can, you can't you can't you can't possibly extend the absoluteness beyond. Uh, sigma one absoluteness of the uh, of the theory of H omega one. Okay, so what we are proposing um, instead of um, as a opposite as an alternative conception sorry, is to characterize the relationship between the truth in the universe, the truth in the real V, the truth in the multiverse as truths across selected portions of the objects. Alright? So in order to carry out this, there are some tasks which have to be, which have to be, um, so this can be seen as a sort of task, operational tasks which have to be carried out. So for, first, we have to formulate a suitable version of the multiverse of ZFC. Uh, the second task is to find uh, multiverse principles, higher order multiverse principles, which in our uh, opinion should be intrinsically motivated, and then formulate a way to deduce new axioms for the satisfaction of multiverse principles with the members of the multiverse. So look at how we are sort of restructuring the way uh, the relationship between the universe and the multiverse. We're not constraining the truth across the multiverse as something which can be referred, traced back to truth in, in, in the universe, in the real deep. We are, first of all, we're saying that there's a sort of flaw of truth, in a sense, from the real V to the multiverse, because we want to capture some general properties of the universe and try to see how this property can be reflected into members. So this is a crucial point. Uh, in order to define, in order to uh, get the results which are connected to this goal, uh, task one uh, was uh, consisted in formulating a suitable version of the modules. And this has been done, this task has been carried out years ago by Friedman, uh, at the beginning of the uh, the hyper universe undertaking. And uh, so the idea is that the hyper universe should consist, what we call the, so our notion of the multiverse, which was called the hyper universe, um, consists of uh, all trans, sorry, countable, there should be countable transitive models of ZFC. So, what is the rationale uh, behind this choice? Well, the idea is that, well, in a sense, you can use Lebanese column 
uh, in a very trivial way to say that whatever is interesting in terms of truth, of course you can already get in countable models. And also that's the idea that if you use all the uh, possibilities offered by model theoretic constructs, you're not gonna go, if you start with a countable transitive model, you're not gonna get out of that. So each member of H can be seen as reflecting properties of B. There's one other reason for uh, uh, this is another feature of the, our concept of the multiverse. And, well, maybe this uh, a little more um, maybe controversial, but we thought that um, if you want to take our uh, point of departure was the idea that we <laughs> should take the iterative concept of set as the um, the axiom of Z and C uh, being based on the iterative concept of set and the iterative concept that seemed to us to rule out ill-founded constructions. Now we come to the logical features of H principles. So as we saw, H principles, we saw that we had to proceed in a sense beyond, we had to go beyond first order. So the idea is that we are not quantifying over, we're not using second order or higher order quantification in our um, H in the formulation of, of the H principle, but the idea is that all the objects that we are quantifying over being universes in the hyper universe can be seen as, conceptually can be seen as higher order objects. So it's in a sense when we quantify over universes in the hyper universe, in a sense we are quantifying over a structure which is a higher order structure. But at the same time, the quantification is, a quant is first order over the hyper universe, and uh, so the objects in the hyper universe are simply universes which are treated in the same way as sets, first order sets. But the third main feature is that this principle should describe, in a sense, intrinsic properties of it. As we saw, we want that this is one of our desiderata because we want this to be reflected by. Um, to be reflected in the hyper universe by um, uh, it is reflected in the idea that members of the hyper universe should reflect in a sense the trace of property to be pictures in a sense different pictures of the real universe. All right, so now we come to uh, to concrete examples in a sense of basic. And that's where all the story began, actually. So this is our, the uh, multiverse principles, of course, at the time of their, when they were, were first subjected to mathematical investigation, they were not uh, defined as uh, age principles. But, uh, but these two um, saturated statements, um, the inner model, especially the inner model hypothesis was, First propound, and then it's a strong version, the strong inner model hypothesis, where the first two mathematical, strong mathematical hypotheses which were investigated uh, uh, with respect to their consequences within, uh, within the model. Uh, and we believe that uh, after some of course, it took some time to realize that these principles, in a sense, could be generalized as something which addressed, which had some <laughs> specific properties uh, which could be used um, in defining uh, this need to find new uh, saturated axioms within a multiverse. <coughs> and uh, as we can see, these principles are satisfy the requirements uh, of the that we have listed before because so this principle say they address directly universes in the hyper universe and so they uh, which are quantificationally treated as uh, simply as first order objects but at the same time insofar as they address universes in the hyper universe uh, they refer to a structure which is not a structure, which is not a first-order structure. 
And, um, and at the same time, it seems to us that these H principles are connected in a significant way to uh, a feature, an intuitive feature of the universe of sets, which is um, maximality. Of course, we need to, um, we haven't um, sort of um, examined the issue of why maxima the maximality of the universe should be seen as an intrinsic property of the universe, and this is a task which has to be, still to be, uh, uh, carried out. But what we can say is that if we assume the maximality should be a sort of an, an ideal property of the universe of sets, then uh, the principles that uh, I'm listing here encapsulate um, uh, the maximality of the universe. So what happened was that uh, starting with this <coughs> principles concerning universes countable transitive models in the hyper-universe. So, the surprisingly interesting consequences were found. So, to the, we could say, general principles which, um, which lie at a, at a higher level uh, with respect to first-order axioms, one could find universes within the hyper-universe which uh, satisfy these principles <coughs> and universes which are endowed with these very interesting properties. For instance, all universes where I am H is true um, are universes where projective determinism is false and uh, there are no large cardinals. And with the strong inner model hypothesis, a result of the strong inner model hypothesis um, was that the universes in the hyper-universe satisfying the strong inner model hypothesis uh, did not satisfy the continuum hypothesis. So, we are uh, quickly moving to the final chapter of the story. Um, so, the idea was that now, given the presuppositions, given the characterization of the relationship between the real the real universe and the multiple, and given our idea of the multiverse as consisting only of countable transitive models of the C, and given the fact that we think the H principles are intrinsically motivated as they are connected to properties of the, uh, of the universe, then one could say that in the selective portions which satisfied the H principles, then the such relevant consequences of the H principles themselves could be defined in new axioms. So the axioms, um, so the bottom line, in a sense, of the project is that new axioms should be seen as something depending on more general, stronger principles which cannot be captured in a sense of the first order. Uh, which depend on sort of broader and stronger intuition about property of the universe of sets. And uh, of course, there are two foundational scenarios, in a sense, that can be uh, proposed. In the, in the weaker one, of course, since you have truth uh, that only some universes satisfy the H principles, of course, you can have portions of the hyper-universe where there's a sort of <coughs> transition of truth. There are some portions of the hyper-universe where uh, you can find certain axioms and portions which, where you can find other axioms. But it might be the, also the case that if you're able to prove in a sense that, in a strong sense, this is still a possibility of course, but we don't know whether it can, to, to what extent it can be pursued. If you're able to prove that the H principles you are using to select the portions of the hyper-universe, which are uh, certain portions of the hyper-universe, uh, are uh, such a uh, strong uh, intrinsic motivation as to stand as uncontroversial high-order principles about 
about the universe, then you might want to say that, in a sense, portions of the hyper-universe which do not satisfy these principles are not relevant to, um, are no longer relevant. But then we will fall back to the, in a sense, to the eliminative dispute <coughs> that we had criticized with regard to, uh, to the idea of extending absoluteness. So we had to, this is still a work in progress, and of course we had to check whether there will be more consequences in terms, conditional terms of the mathematical principles which are uh, currently being investigated. So I uh, think of my skip the was a, an overview of the differences of the features, um, how the hyper-universe problem differentiated from the standard approach, uh, from the standard conception about the relationship uh, between truth in V and truth in the multiverse, but I think I might just finish with some concluding remarks. Well, in a sense, we could say that, okay, so we have two positions more or less, we could say ontologically, so there's a universe of sets, and all the properties uh, of sets are there, um, and so, and this might be compatible with the, uh, the of, of course, with the uh, eliminative, uh, all right, we can't do that. Um, uh, the limited view of the multiverse, or there's simply a pluralism. Uh, a pluralism is the view that there's a collection of universes where there are, uh, which are characterized in different ways, and their most radical concept, pluralistic, uh, pluralistic conception, was uh, the one which was presented by Neil yesterday. Was Hamkin's account of the of the multiverse? In a sense, we are sort of trying to define sort of what I label here provisionally sort of dynamic dualism. So both the universe of sets and uh, the multiverse are essential to the understanding of the reality of sets. So in a sense we could have sort of understanding of some general properties, more general properties, higher order properties of the universe, which are then in some way reflected into more manageable, and more sort of um, um, understandable uh, and sort of smaller uh, ontological constraints. In this case, uh, countable transitive models in the multiverse. Well, of course, uh, in a sense, I have to claim that the intrinsic evidence in this process still plays a role. So, in a sense, I can claim that the search for new axioms is intrinsically motivated because although the uh, notion of intrinsic evidence is a structure, because in a sense, we're not saying that the axioms we are considering are directly related to the concept of set, but are related to properties concerning to properties of the universe of sets, right? So, H principles work in a sense, mathematically and logically, as intrinsic motivations for the axioms, right? And uh, we still want to distinguish between axioms as first order statements and multiverse principles because we think that it is essential for the development of the of our of the procedure you have sketched. It is important that multiple principles are seen as having a different status from axioms. So axioms can be still seen as first order statements in the universe, but multiple principles uh, have to be characterized in. Uh, so it cannot be confused with axioms, cannot be taken to be axioms directly because we want them to be sort of a, a principles acting in, a, in an entirely different way. Uh, and I think I should stop here. Thank you, Claudia. So we have a few minutes for questions. Lucas first, and then This is a, a nice reductio, and uh, a, a, there is a, uh, the, the theorem too. Okay, now it's not relevant, but 
uh, this is a reductio. Uh, in what sense can be so? Uh, and then the claims. Mm -hmm. If you can go on to the to the claim. So these are claims to be uh, seriously maintained that not PD, not CH. Okay, it's more uh, more axioms. Uh, okay, and then um, it's intrinsically justified property of V. Uh, Therefore, all universe not satisfying IMH are irrelevant. Uh, a principle that excludes large cardinals at the level of Woodins is intrinsically justified. I don't understand anything. This is a, a radical. I, I, I really, I really wonder what's going on here and uh, why uh, you and and Cy Friedman. Uh, what's going on? Because this this contradicts the the history of. Uh, set theory on large cardinals, determinacy, and inner models since, uh, I think, the, say, the 80s. Uh, and so, uh, please, tell me what's going on. Okay, so... Uh, I really <laughs> believe <laughs> that. <laughs> and I could... It may sound shocking a little bit, but... The idea, so, so tell me your reasons for believing large cardinals, the large cardinals are intrinsically motivated. Principles of set theory. Um, so, no, I mean, usually one draws a distinction between small large cardinals and big large large cardinals, right? So usually one says, well, small large cardinals are motivated by reflection of the reflection principle, and large large cardinals are cannot be uh, motivated by reflection principle, and the reflection since the reflection principle is a in accordance with the in accordance with the iterative concept of set, then one should uh, see at least a small portion of large cardinals as intrinsically motivated. Well, this is controversial, right? I mean, one can see. Well, I could accept that at least a small portion, if you see the reflection principle as a, and then controversially intrinsically motivated principle of uh, within set theory, then. I could say, well, at least small large cardinals, at least this might be a reason for not <laughs> accepting uh, IMH as a principle expressing a form of maximality of the universe, which is uh, the, the correct form of maximality of the universe. Actually, the strong inner model hypothesis is compatible with those large cardinals, right? Um, and I think that at a certain point there was a strengthening of that hypothesis, partly because of what you mentioned. But in a sense, you could also say, well, but give me a stronger motivation for accepting... Okay, so we can discuss the reflection principle. So, if, if, so in a sense, we can, if we can see the small r cardinal as essentially justified by the adoption of the reflection principle, well, by the reflection principle, then well, I don't know. I mean, it's, you have to provide an argument. And I'm not so sure that... Of course, maybe in the set theory, no possibly the set theory practice, some more set theory practitioners will just... Yeah, I know, it's provoking you, I know. Try it, Most set theory practitioners would, would tell you, well, we don't need any, any sort of uh, underpinning of the reflection principle, so we can sort of, uh, All right, we, we have go for uh, Sorry, we done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, we have very few uh, minutes for for uh, further questions, so keep it quick. Nils after this one, and then... So thanks very much, Claudia. I really like this idea of trying to sort of get a hybrid view. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I worry about the idea of intrinsic justification and set theory generally. So I think, it, for certain reasons, might be more interesting to pursue the extrinsic project. But I particularly worry about width justifications over height. So, and that's for the simple reason that height admits of a really nice well-ordering. There's a few loose ends to be tied up, but it looks like they're at least well-ordered. Whereas, talking about width maximality, I mean, the version you've given there is just essentially designed to bring out, just give you the IMH. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
I can construct a width argument for the choice, I can construct a width argument for the negation of choice, I can just do, you know, whatever I want. Penker's principle, you know, just give me a principle and I'll find you a width justification for it. So, I, what, what I'd quite like to see is an explanation of why, why that's the right way to cash out width justification if we're talking about intrinsic justifications. Um, okay, so are you more concerned about the fact the intrinsic just so the kind of intrinsic justification sort of provided here is not directly related to the intrinsic cost or is related to the intrinsic cost in a sort of obscure way or more to the fact that max the maximality it's the maximality. Is, so oh okay. Motivate inconsistent principles like this. So okay. choice choice functions. Obviously width motivated. Full axiom of determinacy, talking about functions on the determinacy tree. Existence of functions with motivation. Yeah, but that's why we're putting maximality on a on a different level. This is not on a par on. So we're not we're not talking about maximality related to axioms which work, which are sort of well understood, which are our point of departure, which are first order axioms. We are trying to connect maximality to something which is more general, right? Um, of course you can sort of um, talk about maximality. Well, of course you can provide arguments to the fact that, well, the axiom of choice in a sense maximizes, or the axiom of determinacy is a maximality principle for, uh, for other reasons, but the kind of maximality we would like to investigate, because I haven't provided really uh, any argument in favor of the fact that we shouldn't accept maximality as a sort of standard feature of the universe of sets, but I, I, I think the, the maximality of, that would be related, in a sense, uh, conceptually to the linear model hypothesis and this H principle is a different kind of maximality. But, this, but, but, but you're right, that some of the work concerning the intrinsic motivation for maximality uh, as addressed by this principle has to be done, it's still to be done. Sure, I'll talk about it later. Yeah, okay. All right, super duper quick. Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you for the, the, the talk. Uh, I would like to understand what is your notion of intrinsic, because uh, you say uh, higher order is intrinsic. I say um, forcing axiom are intrinsic. Okay, so uh, is it a philosophical debate, or we just say what is intrinsic for us and that's it? Because it seems to me that what is the philosophical reason for say that something is intrinsic is not so clear. First, third thing, and, and second, um, how do you know that a general property of your multiverse really reflects a property of V? Well, what is the justification for this shift? Also because uh, there's no property of V since we have reflection principle. So. Uh, how can you bridge the properties of the multiverse with the property of these? It's not clear how we can do it. Okay, um, so the first question um, was, um, well, you have to convince, well, you have to convince me that forcing axioms are intrinsically motivated. I won't do it. Huh? I won't do it. <laughs> okay, that's all right. But, uh, but but let's go to the I mean let's go to the formulations of the axioms. I mean you're not really to when you formulate the inner model hypothesis for instance you take the inner model hypothesis you you're not you're not talking about any sort of uh, mo model theoretic technique or any other <coughs> so I mean what is the motivation for thinking that uh, an axiom as a uh, the new Martin's axiom, Martin's ac maximum, and it's a reference to certain iteration of forcing can be connected to the iterative concept itself. <coughs> I don't see how this can be done. It cannot. So, um, I don't know. Um, so maybe you're showing, <laughs> so maybe you're not showing in your, <laughs> you're not arguing in favor of the intrinsicness of these axioms. But the basic idea is that. When you say an axiom is intrinsically motivated, well, I started with saying that it should be related to the iterative concept of set. Now we're sort of trying to explore new ways to expand the realm of the sense of intrinsicness. And the idea will be that sort of capturing this 
sort of at higher order properties of the universe. Um, the relation to the second question, what was the second question? So the how can you know that this okay. uh, uh, well, this is of course like properties of C. Well, this is not, of course you're not taking V as something determined. That's a problem. So you're taking your yeah, intuitions of, about V as something given in your practice, right? So you're not taking, you're not making an assumption about the fact that it, there's a V which is determined and has to be reflected. You're just characterizing the relationship between the models and V as a sort of relationship or reflection. Well, I wouldn't use maybe the word reflection because of, it's a bit ambiguous, but conceptually, <coughs> it's the idea that if you have those kind of intuitions about V, where you're not making, you're totally non committal about what V is like, right? So there's not a, the... No, the, the problem is maybe... Uh, I'm sorry guys, but we're out of time. So we have to cut this out. Uh, let's thank Claudia.